The county jail informant scandal widens as four sheriff deputies plead the fifth. Student protests force the Border Patrol to pull out of a UC Irvine jobs fair, and Disneyland prices are going up. These stories right now on Inside OC. Inside OC is brought to you by Five Point. Five Point is an independent real estate development company with assets under management across California. Five Point is a proud sponsor of public television and community programming. Hi, I'm Rick Reef, and welcome to this inaugural edition of the new Inside OC. We've got controversies to examine and just the panel to do it. Lawyer and Chairman Emeritus of the Lincoln Club, Michael Capaldi. Lawyer, Chair of the OC Bar Association and Chair of the OC Fair Board, Ashley Aitken. And thank goodness, not a lawyer. <laughs> editor of Watchdog.org and founding editor of OC Weekly, Will Swain. Welcome all. So, Will, two journalists, two lawyers is even an even fight, right? Okay. <laughs> the most hated people in America. <laughs> That's right. All okay. Of us. The Orange County criminal justice system has been rocked by a scandal involving jail informants. That's where you plant inmates in cells with other inmates, hoping they'll get them to fess up to things and snitch on them. Well, there's rules for how you can do it, but it turns out law enforcement in Orange County routinely broke those rules, and boy, have the legal briefs hit the fan. The DA's office has been removed from prosecuting the biggest mass murder in county history. Cases are under review and may have to be retried. A judge has removed himself from a case. An assistant DA has resigned. The county supervisors are moving to increase civilian review of the DA's office. There's calls for the Justice Department to intervene. And now four sheriff deputies have taken the fifth in a gang-related murder case rather than testify about an informant. Will, the hole just gets deeper and deeper. It does, and I, I love the image of the briefs hitting the fan. Um, I'm still stuck on that one. I don't think I can think of anything else. But I, what, what's fascinating here is that usually the use of confidential informants, at least in my very limited experience, which mostly uh, includes reading detective novels, is in really kind of rare circumstances where you can't get information any other way, and it appears that this DA working with the sheriff's department has used this as a matter of just standard operating procedure. They did it in cases where it really wasn't even necessary, where they had the, the accused pretty much nailed. And the result has been that very bad people who were turned confidential informant, CI we call it in the business, were, were given shorter sentences, were allowed back out on the streets in exchange for information, which was of questionable value in these cases. And now we've got judges deciding that, well, you know, maybe we can't proceed with these prosecutions, but we have attorneys here to answer that sort of thing. Yeah. So, Ashley, your thoughts on this? And, and you know, the, I mean, the main informant was a Mexican mafia kingpin who was seemed to be the uh, informant of choice in some of these cases. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of times you have to be very selective in how you use confidential informants. Um, I think it's a lot of times people do it for more of a 50,000 feet feel. You want to go in and you want to talk to people and try to learn about the politics of a gang. Learn how it's set up. What's the hierarchy? But you don't want to use them to go and try to find out specific facts about a crime that's been committed when somebody already has a lawyer. Because that, again, is the... <clears throat> is um, against the law and that evidence can't be used. So I think that was the problem that they ran into is not only did they use a confidential informant to speak with somebody that already had a lawyer, but then they did not disclose any conversations that the, that a CI had with the defendant to the other side. And you were entitled to all of the statements that your client makes as a public defender or lack of statements. Yeah, Michael, where do you think, it, where, where does this all wind up leading? Are there going to be heads that roll or will it just be a case that we're going to have some criminals turned out on the street? Well, it's a, it's a really good question. Uh, I think in the end, the district attorney is going to be vindicated here. I, I think an injustice occurred here, but it was not an injustice to the defendant. If you look at the facts, it seems pretty clear to me, at least, that this injustice is to the district attorney. Let's, let's, let's look at what the judge found. The judge saw no evidence whatsoever that anybody put the defendant with the snitch together in order to try to get information from, uh, from the defendant, in order to get a confession. This judge, in this case, the judge that removed the DA from this trial, found nothing like that. The judge 
clearly <clears> stated <throat> that it was clear that the district attorney didn't know about the existence of this of this program with the sheriff's office, the program to, to apparently to try to set up uh, uh, defendants with snitches. And, and, it, and, and he said, this judge clearly said that the DA did not lie about the existence of the database that described these inter interactions in the jail. So in the end, what the judge did was remove the district attorney from a serious case, the, the, you know, the, 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 the largest uh, 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 homicide, set of homicides in, in Orange County, yeah, just, uh, without just any real reason. And yeah. why did he do that? He did that at, as a part of a legal fiction. His, his reasoning was that because the sheriffs did these things, because the sheriffs was withheld information about this program, the DA had to be punished. Now, the district attorney doesn't control the sheriffs, and it certainly didn't know about what the sheriffs were up to. So you have to ask yourself what exactly this judge was thinking. Yeah, just, well, to, just to be clear, the triggering incident here involved that mass murder you right. talked about. That was the Scott DeCray case, the guy who killed the eight people in the uh, Seal Beach uh, uh, hair salon. And uh, uh, so, but Will, there, there, it seems like almost hard to believe that this could be going on for years in the sheriff's, uh, in the jail, and the DA didn't know anything about yeah, it. Yeah, that, that, that strikes me as a little hard to believe, and it really suggests the possibility that Tony's best argument isn't a very good one. It's a little bit like, uh, what was that movie, A Few Good Men with Jack Nicholson? You either do or don't know what's going on in your own agency. Uh, if he knows, it's bad, and if he doesn't know, it's bad. Um, and in the Scott DeCray case, what's terrible is that we've got a guy who by multiple witness accounts, did what he did, and I don't think that's in dispute. And yet we put somebody, somebody puts, you know, put a confidential informant, a snitch, as Mike Capaldi calls him, a snitch. Everyone's calling him a snitch, but I just thought that was funny. Um, we put a snitch with this, with this character to try to get, what, more evidence that he killed, you know, the, he carried off the greatest mass uh, murder in Orange County history. And then there's also this other evidence that came out, uh, by the time this airs, it'll be a few days back, but uh, the Register and the Weekly both reported uh, new evidence from the, de the defense attorneys in these cases, uh, a guy named Scott Sanders, is that right? Saunders? Yes. Thank you. Scott Sanders. Um, that in fact, uh, the, the former attorney general, a former attorney general, Bill Lockyer's office, warned Tony Rakakis in 1999 that one of his prosecutors at that point, Mike Jacobs, actually was well aware of the use of confidential informants. Now, Rakakos was new to the office by the time this letter comes in. Uh, the Register doesn't report that. Haven't seen Scott Moxley's story in the Weekly. Um, but they don't report that this, all of this occurred, this prosecution with Jacobs occurred under a different DA. Having said that, that, was, that should have been a signal. Something's going on here. We're using informants. One of my guys is using informants in a way that probably isn't... Uh, doesn't meet our standards. Yeah, but again, the judge uh, or the... Um, uh, uh, the State Attorney General, Ashley, I'd let, throw this to you. This is the, this is the, uh, uh, you know, uh, odds-on favorite to be the Democrat mm -hmm. candidate for uh, the U.S. Senate, Kamala Harris. This is her office, and it's not just Michael Capaldi who's absolving uh, Tony Rakakis. The legal brief that she filed. Uh, you know, she, she may be a liberal Democrat, but boy, she gave a spot-on defense of the uh, DA's office all the way, saying she didn't want to handle this case. She felt the judge was wrong to take the case away from Tony Rakakis, and that there, the remedy is not to allow the evidence into trial, and that, and that uh, you know, a case is over. What do you make of her rather powerful defense of Tony Rakakis in this case? I think she's doing her job in filing a legal appellate brief. I mean, I thought it was her job is to then come in and let the situation work out through its way through the Court of Appeals and let the Court of Appeals decide whether they are going to um, back, back this recusal or put the DA's office um, back in charge of this case. But I think that what we need to look at is, you know, even the DA's office has said that mistakes were made. Now, the, the rub on is it, what is it, what is, was it intentional? Was it a conspiracy between the district attorney's office and the sheriff's? That is a big unknown. But what I'm more concerned at in having talked to someone from the DA's office yesterday that said that the lawyer didn't understand that that CI could not be used. And that's a grave What's concern. What's the CI? The, the confidential informant. Oh, okay, that didn't understand you. that that evidence 
could not be used. And that to me shows that there's just a real lack of training in the district attorney's office. The first month that I was in the prosecutor's office, you are schooled in what evidence you can use and what evidence you can't. I understand that we can just look at the sheriff's department and say, you know what, they did it, we didn't know, we didn't have any idea, but prosecutors don't get to do that. You have a higher ethical standard to investigate what kind of evidence you're relying on, where that evidence <clears throat> comes from, and how it was obtained. That is your ethical duty. So I think you know, when we're looking at what the problem is, you have a lot of smart, wonderful, dedicated lawyers that are coming out of law school, going to the DA's office as young prosecutors, and if they're not getting the proper training then about what their ethical duties are, it's no surprise that as they rise up in the ranks that these mistakes are being made. But, but Kamala Harris, um, why would a liberal Democrat come out in favor of Tony Rakakis, a you know, very mainstream establishment Republican? Is there any political calculus there at all? Well, I mean, I think that because she is probably going to be one of the two Democrats running for the um, state Senate seat, along with probably our own Congresswoman Loretta Sanchez. Who, by the way, will shortly be a guest on this show. We'll uh, put that in. Yes, there yeah, is Yeah, I mean, they're vying for the same, yeah. you know, for the same support. So I think that the political argument some have made is that Kamala is, or Attorney General Harris is, um, aggressively pursuing this appeal because she doesn't want to be on the wrong side of law enforcement and DAs up and down the state. That would be a t that would be terrible if politics entered into a matter of justice like this. That was your that suggestion, should... not mine. <laughs> <laughs> what what the attorney general said was that the DA did not know that this database Do you believe existed. That, Michael? Absolutely, absolutely. There there are no facts sitting in front of the court. Uh, the the district attorney has been on the record and said clearly that his agency, that his office, had no idea this was going on. In fact, the attorney general says that the sheriffs misled the district attorney's office. In fact, a number of them testified to that, to that effect. So what you're really doing, or this is important, the elected prosecutor, elected by the people of Orange County, is being denied an opportunity to put this guy, to keep him in jail, mm -hmm. to pursue the death, the death penalty. And I think the, the attorney general, you know, from the opposed party, looked at the situation and decided she had no choice but to, to weigh in on the side of the district attorney here. You know, uh, another aspect of this is that because of this controversy, this scandal with the informants, the many legal briefs that are being filed, <clears throat> it's really affected the families of crime victims and Absolutely. that uh, it's yeah. delayed justice in some cases. And uh, Steve Herr is the father of one of the two victims of accused killer Daniel Patrick Wozniak. And he blames Scott Sanders, who is the uh, public defender we've been talking about. He's also Wozniak's lawyer, uh, for a five-year delay in the start of that trial. And Herr gave me a statement that reads in part, Mr. Sanders has been using the guise of the informant's controversy to stall proceedings in our trial. Mr. Sanders knew three to four years ago that no informants or their statements would be used. I feel that Mr. Sanders is using our case, along with the Seal Beach case, to further his agenda against the OCDA's office, as well as the OC Sheriff's Department. I personally find this repulsive. Uh, Will, you can, you can feel the pain that this father is going through. Um, what, what do you make of this? Well. First of all, nobody would want to uh, take the place of you know, somebody who's been a victim of one of these horrific crimes. I, I can't even imagine, you know, having one of your own children taken like that. My guess is that Mr. Herr would feel the way I do, which is I'd like to be put in the cell with the guy who killed my child just for a little bit. Um, so that's why we have government. We have government to keep, sorry about that. I just, I was actually imagining yeah. it for a moment and I was yeah. there. Yeah. So that's why we have government. We have government to step in and keep people like me acting on a natural paternal impulse to protect my child and seek vengeance from seeking vengeance. Um, and these, I can understand exactly how bitter he would feel. Well, no, I can't understand exactly. I wouldn't begin to say that. I, can, I think I can understand how bitterly he feels about this. And at the same time, this is why we have government, this is why we have constitutional protections, so that we don't descend into a war of all against all. Yeah, Ashley, as you know, there are people who consider Scott Sanders a folk hero, particularly in, among the public defenders, that he would basically take on the establishment and score, uh, you know, victories like this. On the other hand, as you know, there are people in the prosecutor's office that detest him. You've got some of the uh, uh, crime victims saying that he's just running out the clock. Clearly, he's trying to get the 
uh, death penalty removed for Wozniak, and so he's kind of running out the clock. Is this is this right in the legal system that you you know you can kind of run run the clock out uh, like that? Well, his job to his client is to enforce their constitutional rights, and if he believes that there is evidence that's either been fabricated or illegally obtained, it is his ethical duty to advocate on behalf of his client. Now, what I think is really surprising is we have, in the case of Scott Sanders, somebody that is a public servant that could have done a lot of things with a brilliant legal career, but instead chose to go to the public defender's office and serve his county. And instead of looking at the issues, what can we do better? How can we make this go away? What did we do wrong? Let's learn from this. We want to put a target on the back of Scott Sanders, who is just doing his job. I mean, I, I think that that's really, again, when you have this type of um, action from the DA's office, I think they're missing the mark. He's not the bad guy. The bad guy is either the deputies or the DA's office and them working together. But focus on it and let's change it. Michael, do you think he's the bad guy? I, I, I agree that this is an attorney who has to represent his client zealously. Uh, you know, uh, you, I guess you could quibble with tactics here and there, but the reality is he's going to be aggressive, and he should be aggressive. These people are entitled to a fair trial, every one of them. And I think he's doing that. The problem is you, you, when a judge makes an error in judgment, as, as I think that they've done in this Decray case, um, what, what that has done is delayed the resolution of that case for at least a year. So you've got these families out there who are waiting and waiting and waiting for the system to do something about this murderer. And, and every day, you know, uh, without your, your wife, uh, your, your spouse, your husband, is a day of pain until this gets resolved. The judge has a responsibility to stop the abuse of, a, 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 of an over-aggressive defense attorney. Okay. Finally, uh, we've gone, uh, one last uh, question for you, Michael. We've gone through this whole discussion, never mentioned Sheriff Sandra Hutchins. It's her deputies who were found to have either lied or misled on the witness stand. Uh, she's been cooperating as the county supervisors consider more civilian review. Tony hasn't been cooperating. Um, does, she have, does she suffer any political fallout from this? I, I don't think she suffers uh, any political fallout for this. I think she's well-liked, she's well-respected. Um, you know, the question really is whether she knew about how those under her were operating. Now, um, it, it's, it's really plausible that she didn't know what these deputies were saying on the stand. Uh, but in terms of operating a snitch program that, that uh, she didn't know about, keep in mind, no one so far has found, no judge or otherwise, ha has found proof that the sheriffs are really putting inmates together so that one can get a confession from the other. There's no evidence of that right now. Now, you know, maybe there will be in the future, but that's not a problem for her today. Michael, I don't I mean this. think that's true. Okay. Please, I mean, they, they have records from the TREAD system that have notations under it that say, move this person to that cell. Correct. And you cannot move this person from that cell until a supervising deputy removes but that. But why? But the question is why. You, it, it's very difficult. They, these, these TREAD records do show when, when the sheriffs and special handlers were moving inmates from one cell to another, no, without question about that. But, but in order to get to the question of whether they're abusing these people's rights, you have to have to ask why they're doing that. So I mean, and that's not really, that's not, that's not showing in these trends that I've seen. But if the later entry then shows that this person was removed from the cell for lack of getting information, well, what kind of information yeah. are we talking about? We're talking about information that would lead okay. to a conviction well, or would be to, case specific. Yeah, to be continued. But, you know, Will, there is one other thing that struck me. Your opinion. Is Orange County the only place in the whole United States where this no, goes on? No, I think this is, um, you know, I work with a bunch of national reporters, and I think this is the really terrifying thing. Whether you're on the left or the right is almost irrelevant at this point. It's a government power, the, the power of coercion, the government's monopoly on, on coercive force is terrifying. Um, we've covered a case in Wisconsin where a, de a rogue Democrat DA used the Milwaukee DA's office to go after his conservative political opponents on what he thought were campaign speech violations, but he you know, used battering rams to knock down their doors, invade their homes with armed cops uh, in early morning hours, rousted their kids out of bed and took their computers and papers and emails. Uh, I could go on. This right. happens okay. all across so, so, the country. So we, we may hear more about this type of thing. I, I, undoubtedly. Okay. Well, UC Irvine held a jobs fair, but one invited employer, the U.S. Border Patrol, didn't come. It was going to, but withdrew after objections and fears of demonstrations from students who said the Border Patrol's presence on campus would upset the university's undocumented students. So, Michael, is this a case of students expressing 
free speech and taking a principled mm. stand, or is it an example of politically correct intolerance? Well, it, it is an example, uh, as the LA Times editorial board called it, uh, of a group of students trying to suppress free speech. This has got nothing to do with free speech at all. In fact, there's something really rotten happening at UCI right now. Um, if you look at that petition, uh, it says that the border between the United States and Mexico is an arbitrary line meant to interfere with migration. These people aren't just against the border patrol. They're against borders to begin with. This is the same campus where in 2010, you'll remember, uh, you had a group of Muslim uh, students shouting down the uh, Israeli ambassador to the United States. Why? Because they didn't want him to express his views to other students. It's the same school where only last semester student leadership voted to remove the American flag from an administration building. Now, you know, this is a flag that, 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 that Americans, it is subversive. It, it's, it's a flag that Americans have fought under to liberate millions of people over the last 50 years. And these kids who are uh, uh, getting their degrees from a federally subsidized, taxpayer-supported university apparently are ashamed of the flag of the United States, ashamed of the work that the Border Patrol does. Who really gets hurt here? It's people who have opposing opinions, and it's kids who want to go to and, and check out the Border Patrol as a possible <clears throat> employer. This is something that these students really have to answer for. Let me add, let me add just a little nuance. I think um, the flag ban was immediately rescinded in about days later by a, I by, think, by faculty, not by the students. Uh, the, led by a student, the student president of the Associated Students, who asked them to do this. Um, representing, I think, the, the check that we have on young people who sometimes have crazy opinions on any side of, of any, take any issue. Um, that, that was, I, I'm with you. That is a repellent thing to argue about the American flag. The second, with the Border Patrol, I'm really intrigued by the fact that it was the Border Patrol that pulled out. Students mm -hmm. have a right, I think, to say stupid things. That's kind of what goes on in college and, of course, right here on the soundstage if you're listening to me right now. People say things, right? And they have a right to say those things. The Border Patrol's decision was its own decision to pull out. It didn't pull out because the students made them. Nobody coerced them. The university said, gee, we thought the petition didn't really threaten anybody's safety. But the, I think the Border Patrol, for its own reasons, made this decision. Like, you know, maybe well, this is I just think, not a, What do you think I, those I, reasons I, were? That it didn't want the bad publicity that right. might be attendant on, let's say, a demonstration, right. for example. Exactly. Um, so they were forced. They didn't do this on their own volition. They were really forced <clears> to do this <throat> on pain of embarrassment. No, they I, didn't, want, they, they didn't I, want the protesters. But I think this is what we need more of on the campus, is for the, for the university system for the, the administrators, the faculty, and other students to say to these students, you have a right to express yourselves and you're a moron, right? And then the, and then the Border Patrol should show up anyway. And I think we don't, important. one second, we don't teach the students, I swear I'm almost done, I'm not a Baptist minister here. We, we have, the, 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 the students have a right to say stupid things. We don't want to say to them that every time you say something, it's incumbent on us to act in your, on your behalf. The Border Patrol capitulated, it shouldn't have, the administration, appropriately said, we think they should come, the Border Patrol should come. We need to teach more vigorous free speech, not shutting people down. I'm with you on the problem with the Muslim group that shot it down, the ambassador, wrong, shouting out, you know, shutting down the American, taking down the American flag, wrong. So when students engage in free speech, we ought to encourage more free speech, not less, to protect that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think this story was upsetting to me because it's probably the first time that I saw something on Fox News that I agreed with. And it was a very uncomfortable <laughs> feeling for me. Um, and you know, I do feel that the Border Patrol overreacted. I mean, you looked at the petition on change.org, and it was signed by hundreds of people. No verification that any of them were UCI students. And it was speaking towards the five, approximately 500 undocumented students throughout UCI, which is less than 2% of the student population. So. Um, I thought the fact that the Border Patrol wasn't able to go there, I mean, that's a very viable career for somebody. Mm. It's a strong career. It is in service to your country. So for people to say, I don't agree with it, I don't want to work there, hence nobody gets the opportunity mm -hmm. to interview or work there is ridiculous. I think if they were coming in some type of enforcement capacity, then I could understand the protest. But really, they were probably going to send HR, a couple of people from HR. I mean, how threatening so, is Ashley, that? So, Ashley, do you think that the Border Patrol was either being uh, too timid or uh, 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 
you know, too uh, skittish about this uh, because, after all, had they come, it's likely, or, or at least very possible, there would have been demonstrations. So here you have a job fair and you've got some people protesting and yelling and carrying signs, and they're saying uh, we, didn't, we didn't want to bring that onto the campus. I mean, I think probably out of respect to not call attention from the positive things that are going to come out of this job fair, they just said, if we go, we are going to be the focus of attention, and that's not the point. And, you know, I feel that they had to refund the $600 that the Border Patrol paid them. They were going to go pay to get abused. I mean, I don't think that that's what they really okay. want to do with their Saturday. And I guess that that just about does it. So we are out of time. We never got to talk about Disney prices going up. Ashley, you don't like that, right? Uh, well, selfishly, I'm a premium pass holder. Oh, so that's so going to... That's like 250 <laughs> bucks more next year. Okay. So anyway, that, that will do it. Uh, that'll do it for us. Um, that's it for now. Uh, thanks to my guests, Michael Capaldi, Ashley Aitken, and Will Swaim. You can watch this show at pbssocal.org. Click Productions and then the Inside OC logo, or go to rickreef.com. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again on Inside OC. Inside OC is brought to you by Five Point. Five Point is an independent real estate development company with assets under management across California. Five Point is a proud sponsor of public television and community programming.